So I'm going to tell you how to stop testing and break your code base. So it's probably pretty obvious that um, there's a little bit of passive aggression in there. <laughs> I'm kind of, kind of going to tell you the opposite. But I'm going to tell you a story. So I'm Claire Sudbury. I'm a software engineer, and I have been for 22 years. These days, I'm also an independent technical coach, which means that I help teams to learn and consolidate good software engineering practices, such as test-driven development, uh, refactoring, pair programming. So that should mean that I never put a foot wrong, right? Um, I always do everything right because I'm an expert and I know how things are supposed to be done. Um, but no, unfortunately, I am very far from perfect. Um, maybe this is because my career was in two halves. So I have been doing this for 22 years, but for the first 12 years, I was nowhere close to being a consultant. I was just another jobbing software engineer. It was just my job. Um, and actually, the first few years, I was all kind of excited and wanting to do a really good job. Um, but I got quite cynical and demoralized quite quickly, didn't really believe that I was ever going to get to do the interesting stuff or was clever enough to do the clever stuff. So it was just my job. And in fact, if I wanted to do something creative or exciting, I turned in other directions. I actually wrote a couple of novels during those first 12 years. Um, I had children. My job as a software engineer was just the thing that put food on the table. Uh, and that does mean that I am used to the ordinary bad practice that exists in normal software development for most people. I'm also used to not even caring very much about that. Um, so maybe that puts me in a better position to help people go on a journey where they decide that actually software quality is not only something worth working for, but something that can be enjoyable. Um, but still, the fact is I still don't always practice what I preach. Uh, and that means that I can understand it when I meet teams who don't always follow good practice. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell you a confessional story. Um, it starts out happy. The protagonist has a quest. Um, they're excited. They're reaching their goal, but then disaster strikes. So the question is, how will they overcome adversity? And what will they learn along the way? And what can you learn? Uh, and the story does have a happy ending. And you've probably already worked out the protagonist is me. Uh, and the quest was to create a brand new iOS app, a game, in fact. Uh, and the disaster came because the tests were woefully inadequate, uh, but the lessons learned were to make the most of test-driven development and pair programming. So, uh, because the fact is that those things really do make a difference and they can make us happy. And this is my son, Felix, on the left. This is a gratuitous proud mum moment. He is, in fact, now a professional circus performer. He's currently, now this is just totally proud mum bragging, um, but this is Felix on the left and he is currently working as a professional Chinese pole performer in Guardians of the Galaxy Secret Cinema in London. So if you get a chance to go to see the Secret Cinema performance in London, it's still on until December. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is Squarefill. This is an iOS app that I have now been working on for, I think, five or six years. Uh, and my quest was to write this app. But more specifically, my quest was to create this game. Now, I like to play games. But I'm not so I'm not one of the I don't do all of kind of the immersive um, RPG or, or multiplayer games. I like to play little apps on my phone that allow me to move shapes around on a screen. Like so think Tetris and anything like Tetris. They 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 tweak little happy endorphins in my brain. I really like moving shapes around on a screen. And from what I understand, I'm not the only one. But Really, I was making the game for myself, partly because I enjoy playing this kind of game, 
partly because I'm a software engineer and I thought, how cool would it be if I could make one of these for myself? Partly because I'd never done any kind of iOS app development and I have an iPhone. And I thought, wouldn't that be great if I could make an app that would actually work on my phone? Um, and partly just because I'm a geek and I like, you know, playing with um, different types of software engineering. Um, but what this means is that the game for me is not just to play the game. It is also to keep up with my own mastery and boredom of the game. So when I first created the game, I very quickly got good at it and then got bored. So I instantly wanted more features, more levels. I wanted it to be more challenging for me as the person playing the game, um, which meant that I want new features all the time. So I became my own product owner, my own stakeholder, my own person wielding a big stick and saying, move faster, move faster, move faster, never mind test, just deliver the next new feature. And nobody could see the code except me. So it didn't matter if I wrote terrible code and if I cut corners and if I was impatient because I just wanted those new features. Um, but because I'm a software engineer, uh, I do actually care about code quality. So that was also an element, and it did mean that I didn't feel great about uh, when the code wasn't good. But I was very impatient. And also, this was a hobby. This wasn't my job. I'm not, I never have been an iOS um, uh, developer. It's never been my day job. I am a software engineer, but typically I've done full stack development. I've done front end development. I've done web development. But I have never, as a professional, been an iOS app developer. This has only ever been a hobby. Um, and because it was a hobby, I was doing it late at night uh, in the gaps between the rest of my life. I was doing it when there were small children who needed looking after. So the only time that I could find was late at night when I was tired, I wasn't at my best, or maybe it was at weekends, um, but I wasn't necessarily well rested or in the best state of mind to be sensible <laughs> about what I was doing. But it was fine, like it was okay, I don't need tests. What I did was I just wrote acceptance tests initially and I didn't write unit tests, but hey, who cares? Um, but actually, yeah, it causes problems. This is my other son, Oscar, who is a gymnast, which is how come when he falls over on the ice, he gets to do that. <laughs> so not having tests, not having unit tests causes pain. What I'd got myself into was a situation where I was only writing very high level acceptance tests that described the behavior of the system from the point of view of the user and I wasn't writing unit tests. And the excuse that I gave myself was unit tests are finicky and time consuming. And a lot of the time you're just testing ridiculous things that you know are gonna pass. Um, it, surely it's more important to describe the system from the point of view of the user and make sure that it is behaving as the user expects it to behave. And also, I, I managed to rationalize it to myself by saying, this is an experiment. I'm seeing what happens if you only <laughs> write acceptance tests. Um, uh, and this is what happened. So uh, a, a lot of pain was caused. So the things that I'm going to describe that were problematic were um, the encapsulation of my system, um, the single rep responsibility principle, uh, I'm going to talk about public versus private, I'm going to talk about debugging, refactoring, fast feedback, edge cases, and productionizing spikes. So these are all um, problems I encountered that were highlighted by the approach that I was taking, and basically my laziness. So let's talk about encapsulation first of all. What is encapsulation? So Martin Fowler says, the essence of encapsulation is turning a design decision into a secret. So the idea of encapsulation is that you are writing well-factored modules of code that are well encapsulated, which means that they expose an interface to their clients, which describes what they do, but how they do it is their business. Um, he also starts, he also says, 
um, modules should be arranged around system secrets, each module hiding its secret from the other modules. Then if the secret thing changes, you avoid a ripple effect. Sounds great. Makes perfect sense. Now, you might think that if I was writing acceptance tests, then at least we might have some good encapsulation because the acceptance tests are viewing the system from the point of view of an external user, a client. And so the interface that is being served up as a testable, testable interface to these tests will at least help to encapsulate the system. Um, but my acceptance tests were very high level. And uh, really, I was actually just causing myself problems because what I was doing was I was describing the system's behavior from such a high level point of view um, that it really wasn't terribly helpful in terms of writing well factored, well encapsulated models. And I will, uh, modules, sorry, and I will come back to that. But basically, acceptance tests on their own did not help with encapsulation. So the other problem that I had was the single responsibility principle. Um, encapsulation on its own is not enough. So you might have a well encapsulated model that's hiding its secrets, but it might be hiding too many secrets. It might be, it might have responsibility for too many secrets. And ideally what you want is well factored modules that are only responsible for very small parts of the system so that therefore it's very easy to reduce the dependencies between modules and um, switch things in and out and not have one thing break when something else changes. Again, because I only had acceptance tests, there was nothing enforcing the single responsibility principle. Um, there, were, there, were, it, there was nothing that prevented modules from having too many responsibilities, which was indeed the problem that I faced. So later on, I'll talk about that in a bit more detail and talk about how to fix that. Another issue is the problem of thinking about what should be public and what should be private in your modules. Um, so when things are well encapsulated, then the public interface is describing the behavior of the module. Therefore, you don't want to test private methods. In fact, ideally what's happening is your tests are telling you what should be exposed. Now we're talking about unit tests, which of course I didn't have. But ideally what unit tests will do is they'll tell you what should be exposed. And therefore, they will also give you an idea of what should be public. But what you can do is you can find yourself in a situation where there's stuff that's private that you still want to test. Now, given that I didn't have unit tests at all, <laughs> then there was nothing helping me with this. Uh, but I will, um, I will talk about that a little bit later as well. So what about debugging? So this, this screenshot that I, I've shown now already, this actually describes a particular piece of functionality that exists in this game. So the way the game works is you start with a grid that actually looks like the one on the right. You start with an empty grid and a bunch of pieces down at the bottom that have been shuffled. So you can't tell how you're going to get them in the grid to create the left hand image, which is your finished state that you're aiming for. It's basically a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, it's a jigsaw puzzle that always ends up with a similar pattern. In fact, now in more recent versions of the game, you have a choice of patterns, but they're all based on the rainbow because it's pretty. Um, and so there are lots of different rainbow based patterns, but each game is individual and unique because randomly um, the size and shape of the pieces has been determined by the software. So if you look carefully, you can just see in the top left there, there is a two by two square piece, which in the bottom right there is, is down in the bottom right. And you can see that that two by two square piece is going to need to go in the top left corner when you solve the puzzle. There's an extra constraint, which is that the pieces are not allowed to move over each other. They have to move around each other. So they get in each other's way, which makes it not like a jigsaw puzzle. You can't just pick a piece up and plonk it somewhere. You have to move it around the other pieces and around the edge of the grid to get it to where you want it to go. But um, the way the software works is it starts out by generating that, 
then it shuffles the pieces, moves them around, and puts them down there in a way that is hopefully not obvious that you can't tell how they should be when you solve the puzzle. So there is a, uh, a, there's a method called shuffle shapes in a class called game generator. And that method itself is not even t was not originally even tested directly. What was tested was what the user saw. So uh, uh, I, I always, uh, even, even when I was only doing acceptance tests, I will always um, write wrappers around any randomizing functions, which means that I can write tests for random functionality because I can say, given my randomizer is returning this number, therefore I expect to see this behavior. So I at least had that sorted. But all I was doing was saying, this is what the screen should look like. What I wasn't even doing was directly testing that method with unit tests. And that meant that when things broke, and they did, it was very difficult to debug. Because all I knew was that that didn't look like that. Why didn't it look like that? Don't know. Which bit was broken? Don't know. And the amount of possible places where the bug might be was, was high. There were a lot of possibilities. And all my test was telling me was that this, that this detailed complex end state was not being arrived at. It wasn't telling me which bit of the process that ought to get me to that end state was broken. So um, it really didn't help with debugging. So that was yet another problem that was caused by me not having written detailed unit tests. And this is where you really start to see the pain. So I had started out moving quite quickly, um, but I was starting to see more and more bugs. And every time I saw a bug, it was getting harder and harder to fix it. I was having to um, put breakpoints all over the place. I was having to run up the whole system to see a problem rather than just being able to um, test one small unit. So it was slow to spot bugs and slow to debug them. So debugging was, was really a problem. Um, another problem that I had was when I wanted to refactor. So I had two different coordinate systems going on. I could refer to, um, if you think about, I talked earlier about that top left piece, which is two by two. In one of my coordinate systems, that represented four individual squares. Uh, and so zero, zero might refer to a whole quarter of that shape. But I also needed to know about pixels. I needed to know about pixels because when people were moving pieces around, they would be, the, it, while it, a piece was moving, it would be in a state that was between spots. And then I needed to know its pixel coordinates. And that means that zero, zero might refer to a whole quarter of that shape, or it might just refer to the top left pixel, which actually visibly isn't even in that shape. Um, so down here, this coordinate here could be zero, six, if I was talking about the larger squares that, that pieces are made out of, or it could be 0192, which would be its pixel coordinates. And unfortunately, in my code, there were a lot of x and y's that were referring to coordinates, and it was often not obvious whether that x and y was referring to pixels or the larger units. Now, obviously, I recognize that this was a problem, but when I tried to fix it, that was really difficult. Because um, what I needed, I and mean, I had various possible ways that I might fix it, but in order to make sure while I tried implementing these ways that I wasn't breaking anything else, what I really needed was tests. So refactoring a well-tested system is actually quite easy and fun. Because you can say, oh, well, I, I, and you can move in very small um, steps. You can say, oh, I'll just try this. Oh, no, that breaks that test. Never mind. Why did that break that test? Can I fix that? No, I can't. Never mind. I'll roll it back. If you don't have tests, 
it becomes extremely difficult to refactor. So I just didn't. I just put up with it. I, that, that, you know, the X's and Y's were always a bit confusing. I kind of wrote a lot of wrapper code that tried to help me navigate. I wrote a lot of logging code that would log out to the console. What, you know, what, what is this X and this Y? But even then, sometimes it was difficult. So and what I wasn't able to do was do the refactoring that I really wanted to do. OK, so another problem that you get when you don't have good unit tests is you can't get fast feedback. So, and this is related to what I was just talking about when you're refactoring. You might say, I want to change something and I want to know if it works. Maybe I want to write a really small piece of logic that is to do with an edge case. And I just want to know, did I get this logic right? Now, particularly with edge cases, that becomes extremely difficult when all you have is acceptance tests because writing an acceptance test that describes a really specific circumstance when a piece happens to have got itself into an awkward position in relation to other pieces in the middle of a game, if all you have is acceptance tests, you have to do a lot of setup and then you have to run it and it's time consuming. Um, whereas if you have unit tests around every small piece of logic and you're not sure if you've got that logic right, all you have to do is run, run the unit test and you can very quickly see you're getting that fast feedback as to whether what you've done is going to work. You don't want to run everything just to test one small change. And this brings us on to uh, a related topic, which is edge cases. Now, these diagrams are diagrams that I drew to think about different things that could happen when pieces were moving around other pieces. So what happens when shapes meet obstacles? It turns out there's lots of different ways in which shapes might meet obstacles. They might run into a corner. They might run into a, a corner that's enclosing them, or they might run into the corner of another shape. They might be trying to get through corridors between shapes, in which case a, mo a slight movement to the left or the right causes issues. But then you can bring in a tolerance. You can say, well, you know what? Fingers are fat and awkward. So I'm going to say that piece, if a piece is aiming for a corridor and doesn't quite hit it, if it's a couple of pixels out, let's just assume that that's where they wanted to go. And let's just let them go that way anyway, because otherwise the game becomes unplayable. The game becomes really annoying, in fact, because fingers are fat and awkward and really why should I have to be exactly one pixel correct I want it to go that way um, but implementing that implementing those tolerances is it can get quite complex quite quickly and you have to consider all of these different edge cases um, if you're not T if you're not habitually writing detailed unit tests then you're probably not thinking about all the edge cases and actually, those diagrams were all drawn at a later date when I fixed it and did write the unit tests and did start considering in detail all of the possible edge cases. Um, so, yeah. And the last thing that I want to talk about is the productionization of spikes. So uh, for those who aren't aware of the terminology, a spike is a term that is used frequently to describe basically a little coding experiment. Let's, what if, what if we tried this? What if we tried that? We'll time box it. We'll say we're only going to spend a day on it. It's go we're going to call it a spike, which means it's just a little bit of an experiment. And we might not, it might not become production code. We're just playing around. Now, a lot of the time, um, even for people who are following good um, test-driven principles, they don't write tests around spikes because they say, well, it's not production code. I'm just experimenting. I'm just playing. I don't even know how to test it yet. I'm just going to see what happens if I do this. Um, so um, for me, at one point, I did start experimenting with a way of being able to switch cleanly between those different coordinate systems, between pixels uh, and units. Um, but it was just a spike. I was just experimenting. So again, I didn't write tests. Um, and I thought I'd got it working, but I hadn't. And then when I um, pushed it to, 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 the, to the app and to, to my device, there were problems. And because I didn't have tests, all of the problems that I've already talked about, being able to debug, being able to refactor, everything became problematic. But it's really common for people to say, it's only a spike. We're going to throw it away anyway. We're just experimenting. It doesn't matter. 
And I'm sure that many of you will have seen those spikes become production code because that's what happens. Because if the experiment works and you've already done the, ro the work and you can see the thing working, then obviously you're just gonna, then there's going to be constraints, there's going to be deadlines, there's going to be people saying, come on, come on, come on. So it ends up being production code. So one of the things that I was reminded of, I'm not even going to say I learned because I did know, is that if you, even if you're working on a spike, it is a good idea to write tests. Because apart from anything else, you're not just experimenting on whether it works. You also want to know, is it testable? Because you need it to be testable in order to be maintainable and debuggable and refactorable. So actually, you want to know if it's testable. Therefore, writing tests should be a part of writing a spike. Also, you know it's going likely going to end up in prod. So how did I fix all of these problems? I mean, the obvious answer is I wrote tests. Gone, done, let's all leave. Um, but I, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more detail. And uh, what I haven't mentioned yet is pairing. So what I have talked about is the fact that this was my hobby. This was just my fun thing that I was doing in the evenings. It wasn't my job. Nobody cared. Nobody could see my code except me. To be perfectly honest, the user was me. I did like the idea that maybe one day I might be able to get it onto the App Store, but I didn't even really know how to do that, and I didn't really care. I was just, this was just for fun. This was for me. But what I recognized, particularly because this was at a time, this was in the second half of my career, when I was becoming more focused on good software engineering practices and quality. Um, uh, and I suppose maybe this is a good time to tell that little bit of my story, which is that I did talk about having been just a jobbing software engineer who was really more focused on writing novels and bringing up children than on writing code. It was just the thing that put food on the table. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I never really felt like I fit in or and whenever I asked to do the interesting work, I was always told no. So when I got made redundant, I think 2010 um, or maybe no, 2008, I think. I was just, well, you know what, I, this is not, I'm not inspired by this career. I don't feel comfortable doing it. It's not exciting to me. So maybe this is the time that I just leave the industry altogether. And I did. And I left for four years. I became a high school math teacher. It was a disaster. I don't recommend it, particularly not in the UK. Um, but uh, I didn't think I was coming back. I, I had all, my skills were already stagnating in the job that I was in. The, the, our uh, employers, in their wisdom, had moved us from C sharp to VB. Um, so you know, th things things were not good, um, uh, and and I didn't think I was coming back. So I had made no attempt to keep up with anything that was going on, um, uh, and I didn't feel like I could even remember how to program computers. But then I ended up without a job. And I had to, and I did have those 12 years of experience, and that was the thing that I was most qualified to do. So I came back into the industry and I deliberately got a job at entry level. So I, I said to my new employers, let's pretend that I don't really know what I'm doing. And they had a habit of um, that th their, their kind of model was to employ um, graduates straight out of university and train them up. And they didn't pay well, but I was used to not being paid well as a teacher. And I thought, if we just say I'm brand new, then I can be completely honest about not knowing what I'm doing. I don't have to pretend that those 12 years of experience mean that I'm like a, a, a highly experienced senior software engineer. I, let's, let's just start again from scratch. And I now had a new hunger for knowledge. I, I now had something to prove. I, 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 I really cared about doing things well. I paid attention to what I was doing. For the first time, software engineering became my hobby. Uh, and and I, was, I learned about techniques such as test-driven development and pair programming. I was still newish, but at this point, I had been doing like. Uh, a little bit of pair programming and a little bit of test-driven development, mostly not as my day job, because I'd gone straight back into the kind of roles where I was that I was used to. 
Um, but there was a little bit of it in my day job. There was a lot of it in my spare time. I did understand what good software engineering practices looked like. And I had already learned the benefit of pair programming. And what I was noticing was that I was not pair programming. I was doing this entirely alone with no audience, no colleagues, no employer, no stakeholders. So I could make a mess of it. And that wasn't good. It wasn't good that I could make a mess of it because I was making a mess of it. So what I needed was somebody to keep me honest, somebody to keep me on track. And that's where pair programming becomes immensely valuable. So I thought, I need somebody to pair with. Um, and luckily, uh, my wonderful friend Sal, who actually doesn't work in the industry anymore, but did at the time, um, she was a, an agile coach. She had been a software engineer many years previously, previously, but had gone out the habit of writing code and she wanted to get back into the habit. So she joined me as my pair. And now I had an audience. I had somebody I was collaborating with and I had somebody who could keep me honest and say, whoa, wait a minute, shouldn't we be writing a test right now? Um, so that was the first thing I did. I started pairing. And honestly, I can't recommend it highly enough. And uh, probably for those of you who haven't done it, you might feel about it the way that I did before I first did it. So way back in the first half of my career, somebody had told me about it. And I'd said, what? <laughs> Two people working on the same piece of software on the same machine at the same time that sounds ridiculously inefficient, but also it sounds like hell. I mean, I, I'm not a massively, I'm, I, I'm, I'm unusual in that I can do this. I can be gregarious, but naturally I'm, I'm a bit of a loner. And the reason I was a software engineer in the first place was because the software, the machines don't talk back to you and you can sit in a corner and you don't have to talk to people. Um, and, uh, and so the idea of being with another person all the time, what about if you need the loo? What, what about if you just want to spend half an hour Googling cats on the internet? Uh, how does that work if you're pairing and, and, and you're, you're going to disagree with them and they're going to show you up and surely the whole thing is just going to be really unpleasant. Um, and then I tried it and it was just a revelation. It was like, oh, OK, so you can negotiate with your pair. You don't have to be handcuffed to them seven hours a day. You're both human beings who want to go and Google cats on the Internet. You can give each other permission to do that. Um, but also, you can help each other. You can pull each other out of rabbit holes. That's the one that's most valuable to me because I love rabbit holes. I, 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 I will get really focused on something and I'll be off. Like, oh, rabbit! I'm, and, you know, and suddenly I've lost sight of what I was supposed to be doing. But when I'm working with somebody else, they can say, Claire, we don't care about rabbits right now. Can we look at this thing that we're supposed to be looking at? Why are you doing that? Maybe we could do this. What about if we do this? Um, and, and, but also, I get to watch them Google stuff and realize it's not just me. They don't know how to do it either. We both don't know how to do it, so we can work it out together. And that, that can be a really um, invigorating, enabling experience. So having Sal work with me was a big boon. Um, and uh, what she was able to do was steady me. So now this is both of my sons together. Ah, big brother helping little brother. So I want, I'm now going to talk about encapsulation and the single responsibility and public versus private all at once um, and how I was able to address them by not just writing acceptance tests. So. Um, Instead of only writing the acceptance tests, I followed the outside-in model. Um, so I started with the acceptance test, but then immediately left the acceptance test failing while I wrote unit tests on the next level in, and the next level in, and the next level in. Now, people um, disagree about whether outside-in or inside-out is the best technique. And to be honest, I still follow different techniques in different contexts. Um, but I already had those acceptance tests. And at this point, I was retrofitting tests, so I already had the code as well. Um, but even for the new code, I started um, writing acceptance tests and then unit tests. And so this situation that I had where this was just testing what the user sees on the screen and wasn't even directly testing the shuffle shapes method. Now that I started testing the shuffle shapes method, I could see that it was doing too much. 
you know, but first of all, I could see that it, I could test whether my interfaces were well encapsulated. And just by writing those tests and describing the behavior of a system from the outside, I instantly begin to see how well encapsulated it is by seeing how easy it is to write those tests and to see whether those tests make sense, whether they're easy to read, whether they're documenting the system. And that also allowed me to start seeing that um, most of my classes had way too many responsibilities. A lot of my methods had too many responsibilities. I was able to start pulling all of that apart and the tests were helping me to do it. So that covers the encapsulation and the single responsibility principle. Um, and what I had was too many moving parts. And what I was able to do was to start modularizing my system much more. And while I was doing that, I started to notice that there was functionality that was private that I wanted to test. And what, that was a, what I was able to see as a result of that is that this stuff actually should be public. It makes sense for it to be public. So quite often I might move from um, a private unit within a class to a whole separate class of its own that the first class is interacting with. And the new class has a public interface that the original class is using and that is testable. So I can check that that functionality makes sense. And if you are start if you're t practicing test driven development because what i'm describing here is retrofitting tests so that's not test driven development but it, but then again it kind of is because the tests themselves are helping me to refactor the system so they are now driving the new design but if you start from tests then what th then right from the very beginning you're describing how your system should behave because your tests are describing how your system should behave and that's helping you to design your system and that's what we mean by test driven development and all of this was, for me, helping to demonstrate the usefulness uh, of TDD. And what you end up with is an architecture that has testability in mind. And I was now able to debug. So um, I could identify where problems lay very quickly because I could see which tests were failing. And, that allowed, and if there wasn't, if I found a bug and my tests weren't failing, then that meant I'd, descri I'd found an area of the system whose behavior was not being described by the tests. So when you're debugging, that can often help you to write tests because the bug basically defines the test. The test is, this bug should not happen. The test describes how the system should behave and fixing the bug involves making the test pass. And because I was retrofitting tests to a not well-tested system, that bit did mean that sometimes I was um, prioritizing debugging, which is definitely going to happen in systems that you're working with. And my priority every time I found a bug was to write a test that described the bug, make the test pass in order to fix the bug. So I'm beginning to get tests around my system. And now that I have those tests, I'm always going to keep them green. And that's another really important principle that even if you are writing tests, it's easy to forget, particularly if you're in a hurry. And I mentioned earlier the fast feedback. There is a little bit of a gotcha in there. If you're used to the idea that uh, I'm, I'm just writing a little piece of logic here, and I just I want really fast feedback on that piece of logic. So I'm just going to run a couple of unit tests that test that piece of logic, and I'm going to make sure they're green, and then I know that's working. But you're not running your full suite of tests. It might be that you've broken something somewhere else in your system. So um, another really useful habit that I was reminded of was to keep my test green. Because the other thing that I noticed when I did start getting a better test suite was that sometimes, again, I would be, I'd just run like a very small corner of my test suite and then wouldn't notice that I'd broken something somewhere else. So the other thing that I was reminded of was to always keep all of my tests green. And as soon as one of them fails, fix it. Because if you think, oh, well, yeah, I know that one's failing. It's OK. I'm going to get around to that. That's just the failing test that always fails. And, and we know about it, and we'll, we'll sort it out one day. Um, then you don't notice when other tests start failing, because it's like, oh, yeah, I know about those red ones over there. That's fine. Or you don't notice that they're now failing for a new, different reason, because you never made them pass in the first place. And that's hard. That is hard. But I have learned repeatedly the value of keeping the tests green. 
Uh, and now that I had uh, a decent test suite, or I was beginning to have a decent test suite, I, I finally got to the point where I could refactor the, the, the pixels and the units and the, the, um, the coordinate system. Because I finally had all of the existing code tested, I knew what it should do, which meant that when I started pulling it apart and changing it, because I moved very slowly, I was able to keep my test green. Uh, and just a little point on that. So actually back to the public-private issue. Um, this is just a useful little principle. What you'll find when you're in this situation, or just generally when you're, you're refactoring code, you might find a piece of code that you want to test, but you can't because it's private. And sometimes you, you can get yourself into a big tizzy going, oh, but, but, but I, can't, I can't make things public just for the sake of writing tests. Uh, and first of all, I would say there are no universal rules I I in programming. Um, there are always, it depends, there are always different contexts. There are guiding principles that are really useful, um, but if you need to test something, then it is okay as your first step to make it public. Probably the next thing you want to do, as I mentioned before, is pull it out into a whole separate class that has a public interface that is testable. But don't kind of go, oh, but I can't test it because what about encapsulation? This is supposed to be private. Don't worry about that. You need to make sure your system is well tested and then think about what your tests are telling you about the design of your system. Uh, how are we doing for time? Yeah. Uh, so fast feedback. Um, I was writing fine fidelity unit tests so that I could get fast feedback on small elements of, of functionality. And what I realized, so talking back again about keeping tests green, not writing tests is a false economy. And that is the whole point of this talk. I thought that I was moving faster by not wasting time writing tests. And maybe I did write, move a little bit faster at the beginning, but I very quickly moved slower and eventually I ground to a halt. And really uh, the only thing to do to move forward was to start retrofitting those tests. So not writing tests is a false economy, but also not running your existing tests when you change the code is a false economy. Now, I haven't found a tool in Swift. I'll be happy to know if it exists, but I haven't found one that will just constantly run tests in the background. When I'm working in C Sharp, I use something called NCrunch. Uh, when I work in uh, various other systems, there are lots of um, different um, test runners that will just keep picking up changes and running in the background. I really highly recommend those because they will make those decisions for you in an automated way about which bits of your test suite need to be run in order to cover the functionality that you're changing and they will just do it in the background. I didn't have that available to me which means that I do still have to manually run all of the tests in the suite as often as possible and not doing it is a false economy. Um, so back on the topic of fast feedback, um, there's this nice phrase, don't wait for the racetrack to test the car. So if you say, um, I can't test this car until I have a racetrack to run it on, the equivalent in software is to say, I can't test this software because it's not yet deployable. That's why unit tests are so helpful, because you don't want to necessarily fully deploy, release, and run something to test every tiny change. But... Uh, and so that's, you know, it is really useful to have unit tests. But I do want to add the proviso to that, that a skeleton car can be driven on a racetrack. Now, that is a rather stretched analogy. But what I'm talking about here is one of the principles, and I, and I didn't want to let this get lost. One of the principles that I do follow in software development is that I will always start with a walking skeleton. So when I start a new project, the first thing I want to do is deploy Hello World. I want to deploy it to prod. I want to know that I have a pipeline, a set of tests that work and that will allow me to deploy to prod because it is much too easy to say, oh, well, I'm not waiting for the racetrack to test the car. Uh, I don't need the racetrack yet. I'm just building the car. Uh, and then it's time to release and suddenly you discover a whole load of issues to do with integration, to do with deployment, to do with going live that you hadn't anticipated. But if you can go live from day one with a skeleton hello world, that means every change is going to be ultimately deployable. And that is a really useful principle. So I didn't want to let that one uh, get lost. Okay, so edge cases. Um, 
I drew all these diagrams, I considered all of the edge cases, and I wrote tests that captured the edge cases. Um, and that actually also enabled me to start grouping the tests and therefore the code. I could start to see commonalities between different groups of edge cases, and that also helped me to structure the code. Uh, and finally, productionizing spikes, write tests for spikes. I think I probably already made the case for that. The, 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 there is sometimes an exception if you're experimenting with code that you just don't know how to test because it's something brand new. Typically, if you're integrating with a third-party tool or testing out a new third-party tool. But still, you need to be thinking, how is this going to be testable? I need to very quickly discover how to test this because otherwise it's not going to be useful. So, my story was, I started out sad. The lack of tests was getting in my way. This is poor old Oscar, can't do his gymnastics because there's children getting in his way. But then I started testing again and I cleared the way to move fast and make progress. So no tests is a false economy. Not running your tests is a false economy. Tests facilitate refactoring. It's much easier to refactor. And to be honest, I wouldn't recommend anybody refactor without some form of test. And I have a whole other talk and a workshop on how you can refactor legacy code and how you can um, make code um, testable and therefore refactorable. Um, acceptance tests on their own are not enough. Uh, when you discover new problems, new bugs, write new tests that will uh, encapsulate those problems. And then you make the test pass to fix the problems. Always keep everything green. Pairing keeps you honest, and that's just to remind me there are still three more slides that I mustn't forget. Um, oh, that's just <laughs> gratuitous proud mum again. Um, and then the next one, uh, I hosted season one of the Making Tech Better podcast. There are episodes that are relevant to this talk. So I interviewed G. Paul Hill on test-driven development, uh, Emily Bates on refactoring, John Skeet on coding for fun, Daniel Turhorse North on when is a test not a test, and Ted Young on hexagonal architecture. So if you're interested in that, you can get to the, um, the, uh, the podcast using that URL, and these slides will be available after the talk. Uh, I am uh, Sudbury Software Engineering Limited. I am available to help you and your teams. You can uh, find me on Twitter or LinkedIn. 